So welcome everyone to this uh, very moving uh, session together with uh, Shani Farhi Luria, uh, who is going to deliver the presentation this uh, afternoon. As we have uh, friends from uh, Germany, from um, South America, from Mexico, from North America, from Israel, I want to greet and to welcome everyone to this session. Currently, we have more than 130 participants in this session, which is amazing. And I'm sure all of us are going to be very moved by the presentation of Shani Luria today. Shani Farhi Luria is one of the central power in the International School for Holocaust Studies. She's the director of pedagogy today in the International School of, Pedag of, of Yad Vashem, International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem. She has been in Yad Vashem since 2002. Before that, she did her uh, undergraduate in the United States and she did her uh, master's degree in Turo College in uh, Israel. She taught in Ortora Stone and uh, in various other uh, institutions and she's uh, one of the leading teachers and educators of the International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem in uh, the recent years. And I'm sure Shani is going to be one of the leaders of Yad Vashem education in years to come. So it's my honor to introduce Shani, to welcome Shani for this session, and to thank Shani for accepting our request to give the lecture this uh, day. Shani, welcome, thank you, and thank you to all the participants again. We shall have uh, some time for questions following the presentation, and if you want to ask questions, you can uh, write it in the chat during the presentation, so we shall be able to relate to that following the session. Shani, welcome, and thank you, and good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. Thank you, Shaya, for the wonderful greeting, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I'll start with wishing all of us healthy days and happy days, and of course, a happy holiday, happy Passover. Um, and I want to talk today, the, the title of our session today, Every Jewish Generation Has Its Own Haggadah, has its own, the Haggadah is the, the book, the text that we all share and read on the evening, the first evening, the Seder evening, in um, on Pesach. And I want to share a few things and then raise some questions about the actual idea of celebrating Passover and the Holocaust. And the first thing I want to share with you is, a, is an artifact. Artifacts are one of the most amazing things that we have in our collection at Yad Vashem because artifacts in a way enable us to touch history and make history to some extent very real. Let's take the example of the Haggadah I just spoke about that was written during the Holocaust. It was written by Elimelech Landau. Actually, he was the one to actually write it. His father was the one who was reciting it to him from his memory. Because this family has an interesting story. The Landau family lived in Borislav in Poland. The family itself went into hiding in 1943 after they understood that the situation was getting very severe. And the fact that they had the possibility to work and seemed at the time had uh, were protected by the fact that they were considered essential workers. They understood after one of the actions that the situation was getting worse and that they would, would have to go into hiding. Luckily enough, they were able to find a um, hiding place. Sarah, the mother who had a store, she sold fabric uh, and she was a seamstress. She was able to find one of her clients who was willing to hide her. This amazing family, the Kushiotko family, um, allowed the Landau's to hide in their house from 1943. And not only did they allow them to hide in their house, at a certain point when Passover was coming closer, they kashered their oven. In other words, they made their oven clean for Passover. This was not a Jewish family, but they understood the Landau family um, wanted to celebrate Passover and they kosher their oven, and for anybody here who, who um, cleaned their oven for Passover, you understand it's a great deal to clean your oven. They clean their oven, kosher them, enable them to grind um, wheat in their coffee grinder, and enable this Jewish family hiding in them, in their house, enable them to make matzah, the special bread we eat on Passover. 
it's an amazing story of righteous among the nations that not only provided a hiding place for this family, but also went out of the way to make it possible for these people to celebrate and maintain this very special day. As they were in hiding, not only did they prepare for the holiday by baking matzah, special bread, they also made a point of putting together the special text that is recited year after year for generations, the story of the, um, of the redemption of the people of Israel from Egypt. But this is not a unique story because it's moved to the next example I want to share with you. The next example is another Haggadah, another book, another example of a, of a text that was written, the same text that was written by the Landau's, but this was written in a camp, in a concentration camp in France, a camp called Gears. And here a person by the name of Arya Ludwig Zuckerman, from his memory, wrote in handwriting the Haggadah that was later printed out and handed out to all the prisoners, of course, they were given permission, they couldn't do this without permission, but was handed out to all the prisoners and they together made that very special Seder. Now, you might say, obviously they celebrated Passover, right? It's, it's been, you know, Jews have been celebrating this holiday since they were redeemed from Egypt. Year after year, every, in every diaspora, in, in when they entered the, the land of Israel, they celebrated Passover. Why wouldn't they celebrate Passover in the Holocaust? But is it really so natural to celebrate the holiday when we talk about Passover? So let's look at that question again. Because when we think about when we think about Passover, what is Passover? Passover is, is the holiday of freedom. Passover has several names, but it's definitely the holiday that describes, celebrates, that exemplifies, that symbols freedom. And when you look at that idea of the holiday of freedom and you connect it to Holocaust, it's almost impossible to understand or to think that people would actually celebrate freedom in the Holocaust. Actually, you might say that the whole concept of holidays and the, hol the whole concept of celebrating freedom, these two concepts are irrelevant to the Holocaust. When you think of a holiday, when you think of maintaining time, could they really maintain time? I mean, what was the difference from what, between one day and another? Even before people became inmates or prisoners in, in camps, where they definitely had no sense or control of their time. But even, even without that, Time had no meaning because you look at time as something that advances you, that has meaning. But in the Holocaust, time didn't have meaning because you couldn't control it. You didn't know where it was, what was happening next. And you weren't moving towards a goal because everything, redemption or freedom, all these things were far away. It didn't seem like the world was changing or going anyway. And the idea of freedom, that idea was also completely, completely not reasonable to think of. So when we talk about the Holocaust and we talk about celebrating Passover, the, 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 um, the holiday of freedom, it almost seems like contradicting terms. Actually, the whole idea of freedom, and we'll talk about those two, two ideas. How does one maintain time in a world of chaos and dehumanization? And how does one maintain or connect or celebrate freedom in a world of slavery. And this idea came to question not only when it came to Passover, it came into question even before that. One of the significant parts of the morning prayer, um, there are blessings that are said in the morning where a, a Jewish person praying thanks God for different things. Thanks God for being able to open his eyes, to stand on his feet. Um, to have clothing to wear. But one of, the, one of the, the first blessings that is said in the morning is a blessing that is, that thanks God for not being a slave. And in the Kovna ghetto, the Kovna ghetto that was established in, in, in 1941, Kovna itself was taken over by the Germans in June of 1941. And actually from day one, the Jews in Kovna were exposed to death and murder and, and horrific, um, um, terrible torment and, and, and terrible events. The Jews of, many Jews in, in Kovna, thousands of them were murdered even before the ghetto was established and shortly after the ghetto was established and the forts that were uh, surrounding the towns. In other words, people were aware of the extent of the murder, even if they didn't understand that there was a final solution yet. Uh, nevertheless, they understood how severe the, the situation was. Many of the Jews that were actually 
uh, kept in the ghetto or were forced um, to work as, as forced labor, slave laborers in, in different places around the ghetto and within the ghetto. And one of the questions that came about in the ghetto is one of the, the rabbis in the ghetto tells the story, Rabbi Oshwin tells the story about how one morning as they were praying, one of the, the person, the candor are praying, the chazan praying says, you know, he comes to this blessing. He says, how can I recite this blessing as we find ourselves under arrest and captivity? In other words, he says, I'm saying this blessing. I'm coming to say this blessing. But how can I really say this blessing when I feel, I don't feel that I'm not a slave? How can I thank God for not being a slave? How can I say thank you, God, for not making me a slave? And you have to understand, he's trapped because you, one could say, then he shouldn't say the blessing, right? If he doesn't mean say the blessing, then then he shouldn't. He shouldn't say this blessing. But I seem to have a, a small problem here. Um, but if he does mean to say the blessing, if he doesn't mean, excuse me, if he doesn't mean the words, then he shouldn't say it. But on the other hand, there's a rule in Jewish law that you don't change the prayer just because you want to change it. So he's trapped. He says, on the one hand, I want to say that prayer. But on the other hand, I don't, I don't stand behind it. So what can I do? So we understand that the idea of freedom, the idea of, the idea of, of feeling free was a question people struggled with, was a question that people, people didn't feel, they, they couldn't ignore the situation they were in. So how could they deal with this idea of freedom when it comes to Passover? On the one hand, we do see that people celebrated Passover because as I gave you examples before, we saw one example from people in hiding who went out of their way with the assistance of the righteous among the nations to bake matzah, to read the Haggadah. And then we saw the example of the, of the concentration camp. And there are other examples of other people uh, who made this extra effort to, um, to celebrate the holiday. So I want to share with you another story. And that's the story of Rabbi Sinai Adler. Rabbi Sinai Adler, who was born in Prague in 1928, was sent to Theresienstadt with his parents in 1943. He was the youngest of three sons, um, and he was deported with his parents. And he talks about, actually he describes the, the Passover that he spent alone, but he starts by describing the Passover he spent with his family in Theresienstadt. And this is what he describes. This was the first Passover I had to spend in a concentration camp. The previous Passover, we were still in the Theresienstadt ghetto where we could still hold the Seder within the family circle. However, we celebrated the Seder in a unique way too, because in those days, the suffering in the ghetto was severe. And once darkness fell, we were forbidden to illuminate anything, even, a light, even a light a match. And under, under those circumstances, we were forced to hold the Seder during that, the day. Now I wanna stop here for a second. When we talk about life during the Holocaust, we talk about life being constantly fractured, being constantly broken, everything that you know you knew from before is constantly being, being shattered into small pieces. We talk about constant rupture. And when Rabbi Adler describes that Passover and Trezenstadt, he talks about those flickering lights, those little pieces of continuity that he was celebrating, although everything was falling apart. On the one hand, we could look at this Seder and we say, they're in a ghetto. They're definitely not free. But nevertheless, when we talk about, on the one hand, rupture, so it's the ghetto, they can't make the Seder at night. The Seder at night. That's the celebrating of, of, of Passover is when everybody sits together at night and tells the story of, of the people of Israel, Israel being redeemed from Egypt, leaving Egypt. He said, we couldn't do it at night because we weren't free to even turn on a light, to even turn on a match. So we had to celebrate it during the day, during the day, not at night. But it's not only that they celebrated during the night, he, he goes beyond that. He says, we, had no, we didn't really have a festive meal, but we did have a few pieces of matzah. And we also had what he calls wine. It wasn't really wine, it was tea with jam that made, that made I guess, the tea look redder, okay? So you look at the description Rabbi Adler talks about, he talks about having a Seder not in the right time because it's during the day, not with the right components of a center, if you want to put it that way, because he didn't have all the different things that he needed. But not only that, um, it of course had to be 
a very short theater because they couldn't take it at length. They couldn't just tell the story of being redeemed from, from Egypt, but nevertheless, they're still celebrating it. They have matzah, they're celebrating it as a family. And maybe the most important point of this story is they make a point of celebrating it. But then he talks about what happens a little bit later, okay? At a certain point, he and his family were deported to Auschwitz in May of 1944. His parents were murdered in Auschwitz and he was left alone and then sent to Matthausen. Later on, he was sent to other camps. In Mauthausen, he describes the Seder. And he says the Mauthausen Seder was completely different. After the evening roll call, and before we went into the barracks to sleep, we were, we were allowed some time to wander around the open space in front of the huts. I asked one of the fellows to walk me a bit. And while we were walking back and forth, we recited extracts from the Haggadah by heart, as much as we could remember. A unique Seder night, without matzah or wine, without a festive meal during which all the members of the family reclined around one table, but rather a Seder of walking. Interesting. On the one hand, he said, you know, he talks about what they don't have there. There's no family anymore. It was a year before that that he celebrated with his family during the day. So now there's no family, there's no Seder, there's no matzah, there's no even fake wine. Nevertheless, He's celebrating Passover. And this brings, brings, us back, brings us back to that question I asked before. And the question I asked before was the question of, is it possible to, have, to, to be able to celebrate a, fe a festival, a holiday, that exemplifies freedom, that exemplifies maintaining a special time when everything else is falling apart? I mean, what Sinai Adler is describing at home before the Holocaust, they had a holiday where they sat together, they had a festive meal, they, there was a sense of togetherness, there was a set, sense of holiness, there was a sense of a unique time. And in Theresienstadt, at least fragments of it were left. There was at least a family, there was somewhat of those symbols that are so significant. Maybe one of the most symbolic holidays we have is Passover. There are a lot of symbols on the Seder table, there are a lot of symbols, there's a, a lot of symbolism in that in the holiday none of those symbols were around not the family wasn't around the idea of freedom no, no longer existed there's barely a sense of time because it, when you talk about time it's the difference between one day to another that doesn't exist they couldn't really stop and think about case passover because they had to they had that limited amount of time and the next morning they were just be slaves the same way they were slaves the morning before and the morning after and time had no meaning at that point so what makes them celebrate the holiday, even though everything about what was happening in their life, everything about their, their, their present was so far-fetched from what they were trying to celebrate? And he says, in his words, and let's look at his words as he says them, our bodies, he says, were humiliated and enslaved, but they could not enslave our spirit again, because in spite of everything, we felt that we were free. And that's an amazing idea. It's when we, when we think about the challenges we have today, which are of course so different than anything they experienced in the, Hol exper experienced in the Holocaust. One of the major discussions they had here in Israel is how we can celebrate Passover this year. One, we can't be together with our families. One, we don't necessarily have everything we need. One, we're, when everything is so different. Everybody felt that we have to, you know, how do we go about this? It's, it's so different. And here is a kid. He's a teenager. And he's enslaved. And he has every reason to lose faith, to lose, to, to feel that there's no sense in anything, to, to, that, there's, that he doesn't control every, anything. Nevertheless, he takes that little time that he has to walk back and forth. And what does he do in that time? He recites from his memory, which is amazing. How do you remember something that would have happened a year ago when so many things have, been, have happened since that last Passover. He spends that time, why? Because he feels that he's not enslaved. What makes a person in such circumstances when he's constantly being dehumanized, when he has no control about any aspect of his life owns, what makes a person like that feel that he's free? And remember the title of of this whole meeting that we're having now. The title was, Every Jewish Generation Has Its Own Haggadah. 
And we'll go back to that sentence but, a sentence, but essentially, what does it mean that every Jewish generation has its own Haggadah? There are different ways to look at that sentence, but in one way, it says things repeat themselves in a cycle, okay? Time after time, pe- the, same, the same thing happens in a cycle, time after time, but every time we look at it from a different angle. But the angle we look at the things has the link of generations. In other words, when we're standing today and looking at the Haggadah, we're not standing just and looking at what happened when the people of Israel were redeemed from Egypt. We look, about, we look at the Haggadah that was written every single generation, and it adds up and layers up. So when we're standing here, we're looking back at all those generations and the meaning they had, and then we ask ourselves, what, what is the meaning of the Haggadah for us? And it's based on what we know and what we learned from the previous generations. But let's, let's again look at those people from the Holocaust and what they said and what, how they felt about it. Viktor Frankl, I think most of you have heard of him, of course. Viktor Frankl, who was a, a physician, he was a neurologist, he was a psychiatrist. Um, he was sent to Trezin, to Rezenstadt with, um, with his family in 1942. He has a very interesting story. He, his, we all were all familiar with his book, Man's Search for Meaning, and his focus on the idea that the, the, the ability to connect to meaning makes, makes it possible for people to endure suffering and, and, and lots of challenges. His story is very interesting. Many of you probably know that he had the opportunity to leave, the, uh, to leave Austria to the United States, and he decided to stay because he was going to protect his parents. There's this interesting story when we talk about maintaining traditions and being connected and, and, and continuity, which is a very central aspect of, of Passover. Viktor Frankl once said that one of the things that made him stay in Austria with his parents is when his father um, came back one day with ruin, a ruin from, from one of the synagogues that was desecrated and, 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 turned, um, and, and torn apart. He found a, a, a piece of stone from the, um, from the desecrated synagogue. And on that piece of stone was one of the Ten Commandments. In many synagogues, you see the, the tablets are part of the, uh, part of the decor, so to speak, of, of, the, of the synagogue. And his father came back with a small piece from, the, from those tablets. And that was the piece that was a part of the, of the commandment that talks about uh, respecting your parents. And Frankel says that, to me, was, was a... Uh, was a hint, was a, was a symbol. We spoke about symbols before and how important they are. That for me was a symbol that I have to stay with my parents. And that's where he stays. And then later on, it's a sense to he's, he's not only a man that talks after the Holocaust about a search, search for meaning. At a certain point in Theresienstadt, first he was a general physician, but at a certain, at a certain point in, um, in Theresienstadt, when they realized his abilities, that he became in charge of making it easier for people to, to adjust to life in, in the ghetto. The shock was so, was so great that they felt that somebody who has psychological experience will help newcomers to adjust to the situation. And Frankel even was the one to establish a unit that, was deal, that tried to deal with the, the, the challenge of suicide within the, within the ghetto. He later, after the camp, after, after the Holocaust, excuse me, he later wrote his, um, his experience and developed his, his, his logotherapy um, ideology um, concept. Um, but one of the things he talks about is the idea of freedom. And he says, everybody needs a central purpose in life. And I'm saying this not as a general idea. I want to connect this to the idea of Passover and remember what we're talking about. We're talking about people celebrating in a world of demonization, in a world of chaos, in a world where time has no significance, in a world where you feel you have no control of anything, in a world where mainly maybe some of us would think there's no point. Why schlep yourself? Why pick yourself up from that situation when tomorrow is going to look just exactly the same as today looked? And he says everybody needs a central purpose in life to find significance in life in order to overcome trauma and difficult situations. Human beings are free and basic constituents. So despite the fact that the Nazis were able to control the corporal body of a man, they were not able to control his soul. They were not able to take away the freedom of a man's soul. What does he say? And let's connect it to what happened, to what we read about, what we learned about Sinai Adler. He says, basically, it's not only that a man needs, a person needs purpose. 
basically says freedom is not about the physical. It's more about the mental. It's more about the soul. And basically, the struggle was not to feel free physically, because that was impossible during the Holocaust. The question was, how does a person find purpose? And by finding a purpose, fulfilling the idea or connecting to the idea, to the idea or maintaining the idea or enabling the idea that he is a free person. What is a free person? And going back to the question that I started with, remember we spoke about the Kovna Ghetto. In the Kovna Ghetto, we said, the question was by the cantor, the question was, how can I say that blessing when I don't feel free? How can I, when you, when you pray, you want to believe in the words that you're saying. Otherwise, what's the purpose of praying? So this person in the Kovna Ghetto says, I can't say these words because I don't feel free. I can't pray them. What is the answer that he gets? The answer is he can say that blessing. He can say, thank you, he, he can, not cannot. He can say, thank you, God, for leaving me for, me, for giving me the freedom. Thank you, God, for not making me a slave. Why is it possible for him to say? Because the rabbi says to him, are you only a slave? Or is there a part in your life that is not enslaved? The idea that you're coming to pray in the morning, the idea that you chose, choice is freedom. Somebody who's enslaved has no choices. No German forced no Jew to come in the morning to pray or to say any blessing. What the rabbi told him at that time is the fact that you chose to come in the morning and to pray, that means that you're not completely enslaved. There is a part within your soul that is free, which is exactly what Frankl says. I said before we started with the idea that every generation has its Haggadah. One of the most significant texts that was written about it is a text that was written by the underground um, one of the underground movements in the Warsaw Ghetto. When we talk about the underground movements, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea that the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto began in, the, in Passover. It began not because the Jews the, the, of the underground movement decided to have it in Passover, it's just when the Germans decided to liquidate the ghetto. Nevertheless, it connected very, very tightly to the idea of Passover, to the idea of the holiday of freedom. But it's in this text, and from this text, we took the title to this, to this meeting. They talk about celebrating Passover in the most darkest of darkest times. And they talk in this text about the fact that every generation connects to the generation before, and every generation celebrates Passover in their own challenges, maybe something that we can remotely, but nevertheless remotely connect to today, that every generation has its challenges. And most of us were so lucky to celebrate Passover without difficulties and challenges over the years, but every generation, every person must see himself as if he came out of Egypt. And we know that sentence. Every generation, they have to, a person has to see himself as, he, as if he himself was there and came out of Egypt. But every generation has to also write its own Haggadah. In other words, there's, every generation has its own Egypt, so to speak, that they have to come out of. And every generation has to write its own idea of freedom, its own idea of redemption that is connected to the idea of redemption and connected to the idea of, of being redeemed from slavery based on the generation's experience and based on the generation before the generations before. And maybe the most, the most um, significant connection that we can see, a tight significant connection that we can see is a connection that comes out when they go, um, when the underground um, decides to, to, to fight the Germans and to, to uprise, even though it was against any rational thought, it was not logical that they could win this war, it was not, but they felt that they had to write their Haggadah. And Rachel Orbach, who was a member of the, um, a member of the Onig Shabbat, the, the secret archive, uh, that was established by Emmanuel Ringelblum talks about that last Passover in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto. It said in the same night at daybreak on Tuesday, the first night of the uprising, they were still holding the Seder in the ghetto. In other words, these two things are happening simultaneously. On the one hand, they're preparing for a war or for a fight that they know is going to end in their defeat, at least physically their defeat. And at the same time, they're celebrating a festive holiday of freedom. And how do these two connect? Somewhere in the depths of the bunkers, in silent apartments, apartments they, were used, um, they were used only in the breaks, 
that in the last time Jews sat at, at their set tables, they read the Haggadah, and they talk about what are they reading in the Haggadah? The deceptive actions of Pharaoh and Egypt merged with that, the, what the wicked Hitler was doing to us. The story of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yoshua, and Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah, and Rabbi Akiva, all these texts that they read in the Haggadah are connecting to what's happening there. Like the sages in Bnei Brak, the Warsaw Jews were, were, would recall the miracles of the exodus from Egypt and speak about the uprising. The two of them merging together and mixing together, they, they praised the deeds of the young fighters from Mila Street and Zamenhof, um, and 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 it's it's this connection between what's happening in their present and what happened in the, in in the past, and the two things are together or are, are merging together. They knew that they were doomed to destruction, and it, it, it's it's this notion that this is the end. They knew about it, but on the other hand, they could not connect to the past. They could not not celebrate the holiday of of freedom because in a way, where did they from where did they draw the concept of freedom? Where, what enabled them to even think about the idea of, of rebelling against the Germans? What gave them the idea of freedom? Generation after generation of celebrating Passover and remembering the idea of freedom. From generation to generation, Jews sat at the Seder table. Sometimes they had to sit in the darkness. Sometimes they had to do it in hiding. Sometimes they had to do it with only a small amount of food because they were so poor. But from generation to generation, Every single generation celebrated Passover and passed on from generation to generation the essence of the idea of freedom. And when the Holocaust came about, and when Jews had to struggle for their life, that idea didn't disappear because it was passing on from generation to generation. To some extent, you could say that it was part of their DNA, their collective memory and DNA of remembering the concept of freedom and connecting to it. And the same way their fathers and their sages remembered that they had the responsibility of passing on the idea of freedom, they knew they had to celebrate freedom and they had to pass on the idea of freedom. And it's not coincidence that so many Jews celebrated Passover to some extent. It was part of who they were. It was part of their maintaining the idea of celebrating freedom is what made them free. Because they were able to remember that freedom, because they were able to remember that their grandparents and their great grandparents and everybody before celebrated the idea of freedom, that was an idea that they connected to, not as a new concept. They knew that they were generations that suffered and exile and slavery and, and torture, and they still connected to that freedom, and therefore they were committed to that idea. If we go back to Frankel, who said a person needs meaning, he's free with inside. He, the Jewish people were free from inside to some extent because it was part of who they were for, gen for, for generations. And it gave them meaning and connection. It still leaves us with one question. We understand that freedom was a concept that wasn't, they suddenly remembered it in Passover. It was passing on from generation to generation. But we spoke about time. How did they celebrate time? What was the meaning of time in a world where they were constantly dehumanized, in a world where, you know, usually when somebody's imprisoned, they look at the calendar and they say, oh, we've been in prison for a month. There are three months or two years or seven years to go. When you talk about Jews in the Holocaust, they couldn't look back and say, three months have passed, so there's only so and so much time left. No. All they knew is that three months have passed or a year's passed or two years or three years, but it meant nothing about, it didn't mean that time is coming, you know, time to redemption is becoming shorter. They didn't know that. So how did they connect to time? What was the meaning of time? That's a very interesting story. I want to end with the story and with the meaning of the story, the way I see it. And the story I want to end with is the story of one calendar. And that's the story of a calendar that was written by Rav Avigdor. Rav Avigdor was a rabbi of the community of Dorhovitz. He, um, when he understood the Germans are going to deport everybody, he called this community uh, upon his community to go into hiding. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Um, he was sent with his, with his sons to Plashau, then he was sent to other camps. One of the important things that he did was every camp he came to, he would put together a Jewish calendar. Now, the Jewish calendar is not identical to the calendar we use today. The months are not identical, not by name, not, you know, we celebrate Passover in the month of Nisan, which is sometimes in April and sometimes in March, not the same calendar. Every camp he came to, he would find somehow a piece of paper 
a pen or a pencil and put together the calendar. He was also a very learned man. There were all kinds of math mathematical um, um, uh, figures they have to put together. He was talented enough and smart enough to do that. But every time he was sent to a different camp, which happened several times, he had to get rid of this calendar because if the Germans found this calendar, they would automatically punish him because he was stealing from the Reich. How did he have a pencil? Where did he have a piece of paper from? Um, so every camp he came to, he wrote a new calendar. Ultimately, when he was um, liberated from Buchenwald, he had this, uh, this calendar with him that he kept after the war. It took him a very long time to find one of his sons, but when he eventually found his son and he told his son about this calendar, his son looked at him and he said, why did you do that? Why would you risk your life to put together a calendar? You knew that the Germans, if they found this calendar, would shoot you. He says, you don't understand. Do you know how much power this calendar had? He said, when I could see a fellow Jewish inmate and I saw that he was losing hope and I saw that he was in despair, if I could grab this Jew, open my calendar and show him, look, it's almost Passover. Remember what happened to our, to our forefathers, how they were, were redeemed. It's almost Passover. Let's remember that concept. It's almost Hanukkah, the holiday of lights. Remember that idea of light in the darkness. It's almost so-and-so. If I could remember, rem remind a fellow inmate of that calendar, of the concept of time, you know how much strength it gave them? It was worth risking my life for that. Now, if we go back to the idea of celebrating a holiday, if we go back to that idea of maintaining time, interestingly enough, the first commandment the Jewish people were given after being redeemed from Egypt, God tells them to maintain the Jewish calendar. What's the difference between a slave and a free man? Rabbi Soloveitchik says the difference is, one of the differences is time. A slave has no sense of time, has no control of time. Being a free person is being able to plan your time, to have meaning in your time, to, 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 to be connected to time. Interestingly enough, if we, we talk about those two ideas that contradict slavery, time and holiday, freedom and holiday, it's the idea that they were able to maintain time and the concept of freedom that in a way gave them the spirit, the ability to overcome those difficult days. It's not that they had to make a special effort to remember Passover. It was, in a way, recharging. They could, again, connect to these concepts that were part of who they were for generations. It was part of a Jewish identity. And the idea that they could plug in, so to speak, to Passover again, enabled them to remember those concepts that were part of their Jewish identity, give them a special meaning in the presence that they were living in, and write their own Haggadah. Which leaves us with a question, and it's always about questions, right? The Seder night is about questions, and life is about questions. And the question to us today, I think, is what Haggadah are we writing? What Haggadah do we take from our generations before? And from the generation of the Holocaust that made a point of celebrating Passover, even though it seemed like it was contradicting freedom, it seemed like it was purposeless. It seemed like it was, in a way, surreal to even, to even celebrate it. They celebrated it. What meaning, do, does our, what layer do we add on from their generation to our generation that makes our Haggadah, special Haggadah, that gives another meaning to freedom and another meaning to time? So I'll stop here, not that there are not many other examples of maintaining time and, and freedom during, during the Holocaust, but it's always amazing to me Whenever I sit to my uh, to sit in Passover and, and talk about the Haggadah, it always amazes me to think, well, I'm sitting at my comfortable table with my nice table and, and talking about, you know, philosophically about freedom, how people with such little, such little ability to, to focus on those symbols, to connect those symbols, had the power and strength to think of these concepts and how committed it makes me to think of those concepts and those ideas and bring them into my life. So thank you all very much and very happy to answer, answer questions if there are any from anybody who was listening. Thank you, Shani, for uh, this very inspirational uh, presentation, a lecture. And we have a lot of thanks for Shani about, for her wonderful lecture. There do not seem to be any questions as of right now. Okay, so if... Uh, there are not a question, uh, there are not any particular question. 
I would like to thank all the participants who participated in this very special uh, presentation. And Shaya, I want to... Excuse me. Shaya, excuse me. We have one question. Can, I, can we interrupt to have Mindy ask her question before you finish? Please. Yes, thank you. I, um, my question is, uh, with the experiences, part of it that I listened to, of this uh, redeeming hope, through the freedom of celebrating Passover um, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in those days, uh, what is now happening among the survivors and their children and grandchildren in the face of this new coronavirus um, 19 or what you call the SARS coronavirus 2 or um, novel coronavirus, however you want to call it. So, the Holocaust community, the children, the grandchildren, what's happening now here with that? What's your sense, your understanding of it all? Can you make sense of this? Shani, do you want to reply or I will uh, try to reply very shortly? Shai, you want to try and reply? Uh, so it's not exactly the topic of our lecture today, but I would like to say that what we have to learn from uh, the current situation, first of all, that our generation will have to write one day its own Haggadah about those days. Yeah. And part of this Haggadah would be how we relate to the patriarch, the matriarch of our generations, to our old people, how we related to them, how did we treat them, did we do all what we had to do, I know it's very difficult for the survivors who are old, but I can say, to the best of my knowledge, at least in Israel, I know that there is a lot of attention that is put in order to help. It's never enough, but we, as individual, as a collective, must do the best in order to support the survivors on those days. And learn from them. And definitely we have to learn. Shani, all what Shani shared with us is how we were inspired by those uh, survivors and what we learned from them, from Viktor Frankel, from uh, uh, Rabbi Sinai Adler, whom I was uh, privileged as a child to know personally because he was a rabbi of my kibbutz. He was a rabbi in Ashdod and I lived very close to him. So I knew him very well. So I think it's time to conclude this uh, session. I would like once again to thank all the part uh, to thank Shani and all the participants. As, uh, as I've started saying before, I would like to repeat it. We are going to have another very special and moving uh, program on Sunday afternoon, Sunday noon time, uh, 12 p.m. EST, in order to talk about the topic of next week, Yom HaShoah, which is Jews saving Jews. So we have a very special program. We are going to send information about it today, tomorrow, after a Yom Tev uh, on Friday. So please uh, pay attention to that. And I would welcome all of you to join us on our next meeting on next Sunday, 12 p.m. EST. Thank you, everyone. Once again, happy Passover to all of you, healthy Passover, safe Passover, and to all of our Christian uh, friends who participated in this uh, evening, in this session, I want to thank you for that and to bless you and greet you with a happy summer and thank you for joining us. All the best to everyone and good afternoon, good evening, and have a wonderful day.